So uh, I'm going to talk about a concept I'm calling schemaless SQL. And uh, my name is Will Leinweber. Uh, you probably know me best for gem install bundle, which if you misspell bundler and you type bundle instead, it'll download it for you. Uh, about 120,000 people have made that mistake. I got, I got tired of making it myself, and so I just you know, fixed it. Uh, so I'm at uh, Heroku, and um, specifically I'm on the Heroku Postgres team. And so we run uh, a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of Postgres databases. And so first I want to get some of the background of where I'm coming from before I dive into the main uh, concepts. And I uh, unfortunately started out with uh, PHP and MySQL, and my application sort of looked like this. And uh, after a while, uh, Discovered Rails and Active Record came along. And this really you know, changed the way, you know, this was uh, you know, mind blowing for me that I could talk about my applications um, you know, in terms of the relationships between each other rather than just the queries that I was making. Um, and then after a while, I found CouchDB, and I really, I really liked it. Um, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar, CouchDB is a, H it's a database that is run behind HTTP. Uh, you get some awesome stuff with that. You can uh, put caching in front of it. You can put load balancers in front. And um, it has a RESTful-ish API. Uh, some people get upset if you just call it REST because it's not you know, perfect. Uh, you can do some cool stuff with it. You can have multi-mass replication. You query it with MapReduce views. Um, but you know, all that was sort of nice, you know, nice to have. The real killer feature, at least for me, was that it was a schemaless database. Uh, you represented all your, all your documents as JSON, and you thought about them as documents instead of records. And, um, and so it's really easy to understand why people love MongoDB for the same reasons in Couch um, as developers, because you, documents, they're, they're just fun. Uh, you know, SQL, it's kind of hard. Uh, tables, they sort of suck. Uh, having to do migrations is really painful, uh, especially when you start having a lot of data. Migrations can take a long time. They can go wrong. Uh, and so people start t to tend to avoid migrations. And uh, you know, that's sort of not the right thing. You know, avoiding them is just putting off the problem when you have to do them. Uh, third normalized form is just a pain. Uh, you know, my data really often for a web application isn't truly relational. It doesn't fit the relational model. And the, but the real issue is that I want the way that I store my data to feel like the objects that I'm using in my code. When there's uh, a big impedance mismatch between um, how I'm st storing my data and how I'm using it, um, that's a lot to, to think about, and it makes things harder to, to reason. Uh, so going on one of the uh, examples uh, that I want to give of why I chose CouchDB previously, was I was working at a, I founded a startup that did versionings for songs. And so if you, you think about the, the domain there, I had a song, and I, you know, I had several songs. And inside a song, they had a title, they had a pointer to an artist, and other metadata at that level. And then each song had an array of versions, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Each version had lyrics. It had to be inside the version because the lyrics could change as the song progresses. Uh, it had the date that that one was made and so forth. Each version also had an array of tracks, and they, they could change over time, and tracks had their own metadata, and so on and so forth. And while I could have probably done that in SQL, um, I just couldn't figure out a nice schema that would do it. I mean, I'm just I'm not that smart. Um, so that's why I think documents are fantastic. If you come to Postgres, though, uh, you don't have documents. It's just you know, a regular SQL database. But there are a lot of great reasons to choose Postgres. Uh, it has multi-version concurrency control under the hood, and so it's, it has very great concurrency between multiple um, people connecting and modifying it at the same time. The full text search that's built into Postgres is fantastic. If you're doing you know, a simple search on your site, this probably does everything you need. And then you don't have to uh, keep a second like Solar or Lucene index in sync. You can do your search right in the database. Uh, PostGIS gives you geolocation in Postgres, which is fantastic. You can treat uh, areas and polygons as first class um, entities, and you can do geolocation searches with that. Uh, the last version of Postgres has KNN, K nearest neighbors, and you can, um, uh, you can say, give me the five closest things to here. And it can do that with an index. 
this was super impressive because the literature, uh, the academic paper that described the technique that you could do this was only a couple years old, like maybe three or four years old. And usually the lag time between uh, academics and something in production is about 10 years. Um, Listen Notify, it has a, you know, as, you know, PubSub. Uh, I use a, a tool uh, called Q Classic, which uh, Aaron Patterson mentioned in the keynote. Uh, it uses Postgres Listen Notify so the workers uh, subscribe to a channel and get notified when there's new jobs. Uh, first class data types, uh, replication, I mean, I could go on and on. This isn't a why you should use Postgres talk, but I mean, I could, I could give one of those. But there's awesome, awesome stuff. The biggest one, uh, we open sourced a tool called Wally. So if you're not using my Postgres, Run Wally. What it does is it takes every 16 megabytes or one minute, whichever happens first, takes a, a consistent snapshot, or not a full snapshot, but a consistent state at that point in time with the right ahead log files and ships it off to S3. So in the event of some huge catastrophe or a tragedy, you can uh, pull in the, uh, the last best backup replay and you're up and running within like 15 minutes rather than waiting for you know, disks to rebuild. Uh, so please use Wally. Um, but the biggest thing that I didn't realize that I missed from Couch and other document databases was the ability to roll back transactions. Um, all the time now, I, when I psql in and start messing around, poking around with my data, I'll you know, just start a transaction and then do stuff and then be able to roll back. Like That's just so convenient, especially when I'm trying out a new migration. You know, uh, Postgres has the ability to uh, scheme, make schema migrations inside a transaction. So I can make my schema migrations, test it out, and then run some queries to see if it's going to be good, and roll that back, and then do it for real later. But I'll be honest, I miss documents. Well, I did. I don't miss them anymore, because I found a way to bring document databases, the features that I liked, into Postgres. And that's with two uh, features. One of them is, has been around in Postgres for a little while, and one is, is fairly new, HStore and PLV8. So I want to talk about first about HStore. So HStore, it's a key, value, a key value data type that you just have it in one of your columns. And what's fantastic is you can also have indexes on, that, on the, the key value stuff you have. So I'm curious, how many people have in their applications just serialize, has this, have a, a serialized data column that they don't actually can query on or can use? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not crazy here that we like to serialize stuff and use it, um, but if you used HStore, then you can query on it, which and I'm gonna show you how. Uh, so here's how HStore works. Uh, so the double colon operator in Postgres is casting. So I'm taking a literal here, like x, uh, a to x, b to y, casting as an h store, and then the arrow operator is uh, shorthand for fetching a key out. So I'm gonna, I want to fetch the a key out of that h store, and so I get x. Uh, here's another one. Uh, SQL is uh, unfortunately a, a confusing and ugly language, so the or operator is actually concatenate. And so I'm gonna take uh, a, my, a, my previous h store there, axby, and I'm gonna concatenate uh, bpcq. So uh, the b is gonna get overwritten, and then the C is going to get added to that HDOR. So these are some, some basic ways you can manipulate uh, HDOR key values. Uh, so here's another one. You can subtract keys out. Now, this will only subtract keys out if they match exactly. So even though I have an A key in the first there, the uh, B one is the only one that actually gets subtracted. So you know that, that's fun for just uh, you know manipulating these arbitrary HRs. Let's see how they're used if you actually have them in your uh, database. So let's imagine I have a products table that has an attributes column that is actually an H store. So with this query, I can select out all the ones that um, I have all the products that have a red attribute that in their color. Um, so here's another one where if I wanted to change all the colors, this will actually um, add the color blue to any H stores that don't have a color, and the ones that do have a color, they'll get blue overwritten. Um, and what's great is you can use HDOR things as part of joins. As, you know, as long as you index the attributes color key, the join will be uh, fast. Postgres will treat it just like any other index and use it. So here I'm selecting all the, comp all the products and companies that have a red product. Uh, so here's how you, you make a, an index on HDOR. Uh, if you want to do just an index on one particular key in HDOR, it's the, you do it on the, the top example there. Um, 
I'm really upset that you have to wrap it in two parentheses. I think that's awful, but that's how you have to do it. Uh, the second one there, the gin index, that's a general index. It's not going to be as fast as if you index your specific particular access, the key that you're going to be accessing on, but it can give you uh, some nice generalized things. Uh, installing HDR is really easy. You type create extension HDR. You can put this in your migrations. Uh, now, this does require you be on Postgres 9.1 or later. Um, and here's the, sort of the best news. Uh, Active Record 4 uh, has HStore built-in support. And so here's how it looks in, in Active Record. This, the at uh, greater than operator I didn't talk about, you can, you can look up all the operators on the Postgres documentation. They actually have uh, pretty fantastic documentation. But, so here's how I would get that same uh, using the gin index. And this is, this is pretty easy. I mean, you, you do have to type a little bit of uh, SQL in there, but uh, I think this is pretty fantastic. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, uh, Schneemus, uh, put up a, a demo on uh, Heroku. You can check out the source code there and uh, hrdemo.herokuapp.com is an example app that uses HR. You can go there and play around with HR behind the scenes. Um, now that said, uh, Active Record is fantastic and it's you know, made me uh, fall in love with Rails. However, I really like the SQL library from Jeremy Evans. This also has HDR support and uh, a couple other neat things. So if you haven't checked out SQL yet, I recommend it. We use it for, I think, pretty much not all of them, but most of internal Heroku projects are using SQL. So here, how do I use uh, HDR in real life? So one of the things that we do, we run a lot, a lot of Postgres databases. And one of the things we're interested in is the health of these databases. So every uh, 15 to 30 seconds, we connect to each of the databases we have and ask it some questions. Uh, are you running? Uh, if you're running, how many tables do you have? How many connections? How, many, um, how much data do you have total? Um, but as as we learn more and more about how to run a Postgres service, we discover more questions that we want to ask, and then we realize that some of the other questions we asked, maybe they're not that useful anymore. And so by having the observations just be entirely in an HDOR, when we realize we want to ask new questions, it's as simple as pushing new code. We don't have to run a migration. And when we realize that we don't want to check anymore, we just stop putting it in the HDOR. Uh, and so this flexibility is, is really great. Um, another tool that we uh, use a lot is WickleD. And this is a program written in Go that will listen to your log streams on Heroku. And if you format it like this, like this key value pair, your logs that you print out, um, WebLD will parse that out and then store that inside HStore. And so uh, yeah, I've run this on my own logs, so the observations are actually sent over the wire. Um, but really, the, the sort of approach that I've, I've, really follow, I've really liked is a sort of bulk bag approach, where you have a column at the end of all of your all of your uh, tables that is just an HDR there for, you know, for future. And so when I realize that I want to tr try something new, I'll just shove it in the HDR. And then if it proves that, I'm, that that's going to stick around for a long time, I'll take the time to then promote that out to a proper column. Uh, and this has been you know, a really fantastic and flexible way to um, sort of work with my application as it's growing and when I don't know what I want up front. And so HDR is pretty good, but you can't nest an HDR inside another HDR, and it's actually only strings. The keys and values have to be strings. And so we have uh, naming convention workarounds. So if, something, if we name the key something at, we know in Ruby to parse it out as a date time. If it starts with number or ends in size, we'll put it as an integer. Boolean, we end up with a question mark, and then we just use strings for everything else. And that's okay, but it's sort of uh, not satisfying. But you can use it today. And uh, so the second part, which I think is, so HR is fantastic. You should try it out. The second part here, PLV8, is something that is uh, much more cutting edge. And um, I find it very exciting. So uh, PLV8 takes the V8 JavaScript engine and puts it in Postgres. It was made by uh, Hitoshi Harada. And uh, currently, uh, Andrew Dunst Dunstan's been working on it. Um, and so with the, the V8 JavaScript engine, you can now have JavaScript inside Postgres. So why JavaScript? Well, I mean, it really is everywhere. Uh, you know, we've, you know, the resurgence of, uh, you know, JavaScript inside the browser, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, tools like Node. Um, and, you know, if you strip out all the, you know, if you stick to the good parts book, uh, you know, it's actually an okay language. And uh, one of the exciting things is, um, for those of you who are familiar with Postgres, you'll say, you know, what about uh, PL Ruby or PL uh, Python or PL Perl? Like, yeah, so you can do all these other languages inside Postgres, and you could be able to do that for a long time. However, those languages um, let 
can access arbitrary things on the, com on the computer. They can make outbound TCP connections. They can, I mean, they're the, they're the complete language. So JavaScript being a language that was made for you know, being embedded in a browser, it's a perfectly fitted to be a trusted language inside Postgres that you know, you're not going to be able to crash Postgres yourself, whereas uh, it's quite easy to have a bad uh, you know, PL, Perl, PL, Perl or PL Ruby script that actually crashes Postgres on you. Uh, but JavaScript avoids all that. Uh, the V8 JavaScript engine is, is really great. Uh, you know, it's made by Google for uh, you know, their Chrome browser. It compiles to native code, genera generational garbage collector. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, so if you want to try out PLV8, you can get it from uh, Google Code. And making it is, is, is pretty easy. I tried making a, a, a homebrew recipe for it, but because it installs inside Postgres, it doesn't install to its own thing. They didn't want to accept it into the official homebrew repository. But if you go to my, my GitHub, you can get the, the recipe and put it in. But in doing it yourself is pretty easy. Just make install, create extension, and then create language. So how do you use PLV8? So Fibonacci is not that great of a benchmarking thing, but I think it's a, a nice example for a, a quick demo. And so here's what if, if you were to write Fibonacci inside uh, Postgres PL SQL, it, it would look like this. It's, it's angry, it's all full of caps, and uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't like it. But that's you know, a, a good, uh, naive you know, Fibonacci recursive implementation. Uh, the, the thing at the top there, you create, you create the function, uh, you give it a name, you, you have to say what it returns. Inside the double, the double uh, dollar signs, that is another string literal. Um, so everything between the two dollar signs is just the, the program. And then you, you give it the language type, P, uh, P, L, P, G, SQL. And then immutable strict is hints that you can give to Postgres to let it know that um, you know, it can memoize these results and you know, be smart about how it's going to happen. And so if you want to use it, uh, I'm going to select that. I'm going to select the number. I'm going to select the function from generate series uh, in fives from 0 to 35. And you get this. And you know, it's fairly slow. That's what, uh, three minutes? So let's take a look at the same thing if I was going to do it in PLV8. And so there it is. Uh, you know, the same sort of header and footer of the function de declaration, but in the middle I have JavaScript. Uh, and this is, sort of, this is the same exact implementation as the uh, PLPG SQL, but in JavaScript. And it's much faster. Uh, that's because of you know, V8 being uh, you know, great in compiling down to, to native code. Um, I didn't really want to leave it there, though. I wanted to see how fast I could get this. Uh, so I cheated and did memoization, and then it's real fast. So, okay, so that's neat, but what does this have to do with documents? So let's say I have this JSON document. I have a person's name, they have an age, number of siblings, and then some nested stuff just for looking at nested structures, so a uh, set of phone numbers. And uh, here's seven of them. I made, a, col I made a, a table that just has a data column that's JSON, and it has uh, a bunch of these. I put in a million of these documents, and then I made a, a PL, uh, I mean, I made a PLV8 function that is get numeric. So let's take a look at this. It takes two arguments, a key that I want to pull out of, pull out. It takes uh, data, so this is going to be the whole JSON column. And then it returns numeric, and numeric is sort of the top of Postgres's uh, number tree. Uh, and then what, all I'm doing is I'm parsing through J JSON parse the data, and then pulling out the key. And so let's see how this works. So I can take, select the average, get numeric age from the data. So this is going to take all the ages of all my documents and make an average. And uh, it gets the average age, and, but it, you know, it does take a while. The second example there is, to, for comparison, I made a table that just had a, an integer column and had all the same ages in there, and I ran uh, the same thing on that. And you know, that's much faster. So we are paying uh, quite a large penalty for parsing the JSON each and every time. But when you start getting to more and more complicated queries, so this is, uh, the, the difference becomes less. So this example here is using a common table expression, which if you haven't looked at those, check them out. They're really, really great. You can do really expressive queries with uh, select, you know, setting up these subqueries as common table expressions and then using that to uh, get the data out. So this, I'm you know, getting the data out with the common table expression, then getting a series of d uh, attributes from it, the sum, the average, standard deviation, min, max. And now, you know, this is still slower. But with a complicated query, the difference becomes much less. 
Uh, but we can do better than that. So let's say um, if we select the count from all of these that have a particular uh, attribute, so the ones where just the how many are age 26. And so with this uh, where clause, uh, we get it down to, you know, about, uh, what is that, 10,000? And, you know, it takes, you know, a, quite a long bit of time. But what we can do is create an index. And so if we create an index on that expression, because in Postgres you can create an index on any arbitrary expression you want, uh, we create an index on that expression. Creating the index takes a, a long time because it has to churn through every, every single document. But then when we issue that same query the second time, it's much faster. Postgres knows how to deal with that index just as if it was any other index in Postgres. It doesn't care that it came from a JavaScript function. It knows, oh, I have an index. I know how to deal with that. So that's, for those of you who are familiar with CouchDB, this is the same trade-off that Couch has, where making a MapReduce view the first time takes a long time, but once you have it, it's real fast. Except Postgres can combine several indices. So here's, if I did two where clauses, uh, you see there at the bottom, uh, uh, I'm not going to teach you how to read explain statements but entirely, but if you look at the bottom, it's taking those two index all the way in there. It's bitmap combining them, seeing the places where the index match, doing a recheck to see if it overqualified any of those, and then returning the results. And so you can have as many of these arbitrary indexes as you want. Postgres is intelligent enough to know when it should combine them. Um, but here's the fantastic news. The next version of Postgres, which is going to be out sometime around September, if uh, the release patterns hold up, uh, is going to have JSON as a native column type. So in Postgres 9.2, you'll be able to say, you know, when I'm making my table, one of my columns is going to be JSON. It's going to ensure that uh, you know, it's proper JSON. In the meantime, you don't have to wait for Postgres 9.2. You can use a feature that Postgres has called domains, which is sort of like a poor man's data type. And so what you do with that, you make a, a function that uh, ch tries to parse the JSON, and if it fails, uh, it'll return false, and if it succeeds in its parsing, it'll return true. And so you know, taking a look at how this function works, the first uh, select there, you know, that's valid JSON, so it returns true. The second one, lol, that's not valid JSON, so it returns false. Once you have a, a domain set up, a domain function, you can create a domain, uh, give it the function that you want, and then when you try to insert bad JSON, it won't let you. And so this is what you can do in the meantime before you have the JSON data type. The JSON data type is going to give you some more things than just uh, type checking, but in the meantime, this is good. So what can we do when we have, what else can we do when we have JavaScript inside Postgres? One of the things you can do is put mustache in it. Um, so if you wanted to put mustache in, you just paste all of mustache, and at the end you say return, you, you parse it inside there, and then you, uh, you run the template. So this is a function that takes a template and a view of uh, JSON, compiles the mustache, and then returns it. Um, and it works like this. So the first thing up there is I have a, a mustache template. I pass it in some, uh, some JSON, and then it returns it out. Is this useful? I don't know, but it's pretty cool. Um, and so the, the second thing that is actually useful, uh, now that we have this idea of that we can put in arbitrary uh, JSON libraries into Postgres, is a project called JSON Select. Has anyone uh, used JSON Select before? You should check it out. I really like it. Um, so JSON Select is made to work inside either uh, Node.js or jQuery. And so here I'm tricking it into thinking that I'm Node by having a, an exports um, an exports object. I paste in all of the JSON select code. It's really long. There's a lot of it. And then I parse the JSON inside there. I pass in, I pass in exports.match the selector. And now it's running the JSON select code. So how does this look? Well, going back to, as a reminder, to what those, that table of all those people that I have in, um, in there, I have uh, you know, name and phone numbers there. And so here I am selecting uh, the name, the first uh, name, and then uh, the set of numbers as phone. And so here I have uh, the Angie's Low DDS and their phone numbers. And so with, with JSON Select, you can build up arbitrary things and reach all the way down into the structure of your document. You can also do, instead of having that get numeric that I had previously, you can say, give me the age and um, of all the people who are 26 and, and do that. And this is, this is the same as before, except with this more general purpose uh, querying language, JSON Select. Um, unfortunately, 
because if you look at the, the type here back, um, I have to return JSON. So this is, it's taking JSON as data and returning JSON as the data type. And so because of that, I have to cast that number back to an integer to uh, compare it with the literal number 26. And that's um, unfortunate. And so that's one of, you know, it's sort of a rough edge. And there's a couple more rough edges that make this sort of not the nicest thing to use yet, um, but they're, they're definitely things that can be ironed out and made better in the future. So here, here's a bad idea. So th what this does is it takes arbitrary J uh, JavaScript source code, runs it in there, compiles it, evals, and then immediately executes it. So with this, you can finally not only have SQL injections, you can have JavaScript and SQL injections. <laughs> and so, so I'm excited about that. Um, but you know, it's, sort of, it's sort of cool. So you know, return a new date. Uh, I made this slide on March 14th. Um, you can take a large number, return I to string, and you get you know, that. You get happens to be JavaScript. Uh, you can start like mashing around your data and sorting it uh, in the query, so splitting apart all the names by the characters, sorting them and joining them back together. Um, I mean, pr pretty much anything. Um, so what does that have to do with Ruby? So all of that work there should be transparent. Ideally, none of you guys should have to worry about all the JavaScript inside Postgres. It should be, um, you know, Active Record or similar tools should just persist hashes and let you query on them. And so I've started working on that. Um, so let's say we have a product, and this product, all it has is an integer ID, data is a JSON type, and then you know, your standard timestamp fields. Um, and the data thing behaves just like a hash. You can add the number three to hello. You can have a nested hash inside OK. Uh, I'm not that good at naming things. And so you have it in there, and it's, uh, you save those in, and when you save it, uh, because of the already the serialization thing that Active Record has, it's easy to convert that into uh, JSON and uh, stick it in there. So here it is saving, and you can see there at the at the data line that it has serialized that into JSON and shoved it in there. And then when you want to pull this back out, the same thing with the serialization that's already built into Active Record. It's easy to um, you know pull that back out and reparse that JSON as a hash. But the um, the interesting thing is, so I made, I made 30 of these, you know, just with a cost from one to 30. And having a thing sort of modeled after the HTOR support by having a, you know, where cost is greater than 10, uh, it has to do some tricks. I'm not, I'm not super happy with it, so I haven't released it um, yet. Because like for this to work, it has to know that 10 is numeric and then do the casting. Um, you know, that's some of the, the rough edges. Um, and then also having, uh, aliasing that JSON select function as the arrow operator like uh, HDOR has to do sort of a similar thing and get all the ones where uh, cost is greater than 10. And so this is sort of the path I want to go down. Um, I also want to make uh, bindings for other languages because all of this should be accessed, you know, like you know, Django or Node, um, you know, support for all of these so that people can share this uh, sort of technique. Um, and all those functions that are useful, the JavaScript functions, they should be in a, a package. I have a, a, a prototype of this package working on. So just like uh, create extension PLV8, you could do create extension, my unnamed project, that would give you all these functions out of the box so you wouldn't have to uh, manage them yourself. And so a couple last things. So if we look at what we have now, we have friendly documents that everyone loves to use, and we have it in a world-class database, which is awesome. Uh, another thing that's sort of a first is that there's a, a, a proper data type and a language that's suited to deal with that data type. So Postgres before has had embedded languages and it's had data types, but never ones that went together so well. And a, a lot of uh, great things are going to come from this. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, you know, as, as a Rubyist that I, I used to be afraid of is use, taking advantage of advanced DB features because it would limit me from moving from database to database. But after I've, build, I've built several apps, I've realized I've never really ever switched databases. Like once I've had a lot of data in one, the cost of switching is too much. I think that the um, feature of supporting multiple databases as your ORM is really to get, you know, more people able to use your ORM and have more people, you know, have it 
a wider audience, not so much that you are going to switch your application mid-run. So I don't think you should be afraid of using advanced features that your database may have. So I encourage, I encourage everyone to do that. And um, you know, as uh, Aaron said at the, the keynote today, you know, uh, pushing data you know, from, pushing computation locality from you know, the server down to the client is an important step, that trend that we're seeing. I think it's also important to, where it makes sense, do some of your computation at the database where your data lives. You're going to have you know, much lower latency for some of those features, uh, you know, some of those things that you're going to do, rather than pulling all the data, processing it, and putting it back. It doesn't make sense for everything, but it makes sense for some things. And I can foresee a uh, you know, future where you write your application you know, when, you know, now that you have JavaScript sort of you know, everywhere, you could have your application intelligently push data and code forward and back as it's making more sense. Like that's, you know, maybe, maybe that'll never happen, but I think it might. And exciting thing that just got uh, posted today, like literally uh, 30 minutes before my talk, so I'd, I put this in, announcement for everyone. Uh, we have released uh, Postgres.app into a, a, a beta release. And what this does is you download it, and it's a pre-compiled uh, OS X uh, version of Postgres. You run it, and you have Postgres running. Uh, we hope to get it in the, the App Store, and I think uh, by now, if you go to postgresapp.com, you should be able to uh, download a beta and try it out. Uh, feedback would be greatly appreciated. My colleague, uh, Matt Thompson, uh, wrote that, so thanks to him. So thank you. Thank you.